Good morning, everyone. We'll go ahead and give folks another minute or two to join us before we get started with our webinar today. Okay, we'll go ahead and get started because we do have a lot to get through with today's webinar. Um, the subject of today's webinar is eStewards standard. Uh, we'll be looking at an overview of the changes for version 3 and also for anyone who's not aware, version 3.1 has been released. So we'll see at, uh, the impact that that has and any changes that that may cause. My name is Austin Matthews. I'm the EHS Assistant Program Manager with PJR. Welcome. Today's PJR and we'll talk briefly about benefits and drivers to certification. We will go over transition timelines for anyone um, who is not familiar with this process, although the version three transition period has ended. We'll look at the key changes for version three, and we'll also talk about 3.1, version 3.1 as we go through the clause by clause review of changes. And at the end, we'll wrap up with an overview of the certification process itself, and we'll leave a few minutes for questions. If you look at the GoToWebinar bar, there's actually a place where you can type your questions. So I'm gonna go ahead and save any of those questions for the end but feel free to type them in at any point throughout the presentation um, and we'll get to those at the end. So just a little bit about PJR, we're a leading registrar. Um, this is not an all-inclusive list, but this list of countries gives you an idea of some of the places that we have certified organizations. And we have, uh, PGR is accredited to grant certification for a wide variety of standards, including eStewards, which is the subject of today's webinar. In general, depending on the standard, there are many benefits of certification. Many of the standards are written to assist in meeting legal requirements and improving performance. In this case, we're talking about an environmental standard. So we're talking about the environmental performance of the organization. There is also um, an emphasis on management commitment and employee engagement going through the process of obtaining and maintaining certification. There are business management benefits, including meeting stakeholder requirements. Some of the standards um, have a significant impact in improving public image. Many standards can be integrated with other types of business management systems, help achieve strategic objectives that the organization may have. They may provide a competitive advantage or other financial benefits. And some of the standards can even help drive sub, um, supplier performance improvements. For anyone who's already familiar with eStewards, eStewards is built upon the requirements of ISO 14001. So part of our presentation today, um, will you'll hear that again. ISO 14001 is the basis for the standard. Um, so when you achieve eStewards certification, you're also achieving ISO 14001 certification. You'll have a certification for both. The drivers for that environmental standard uh, ISO 14001 um, is a commitment to environmental protection and conservation, reduction of environmental impacts or risk of environmental impacts that would negatively impact the environment. We already discussed some of the business management drivers such as public image and having a framework for meeting customer or regulatory requirements. 
going beyond the ISO 14001 requirements, eStewards also contains a commitment to prevent irresponsible uh, handling of wastes. It also incorporates occupational health and safety, data security, and social accountability risks instead of just focusing on environmental risks. And a company with eSteward certification is able to advertise, you know, the responsible management of the electronics and electronic components that the eSteward standard adds to the 14001 base. So as I said, the eSteward's uh, transition period has actually already ended. Um, the, the deadline was September 15th of this year, based on the publication date for um, of version three in 2017. So all audits now are being conducted to the current version of 3.0. 3.1 has been published as well. So they used to, eStewards used to come out with sanctioned interpretations and you would have to combine, for example, version 3.0 with any subsequent sanctioned interpretations. But instead they came out with version 3.1 which automatically incorporates any changes that were made. Um, so version 3.1 is already available if anyone is not already aware of that. Previous versions of this webinar focused on version 3.0 as 3.1 had not been released. Um, so feel free to refer back to some of our older webinars as well. Um, if you uh, are not interested in the 3.1 changes for some reason or wanna see uh, maybe how things have changed, but today's presentation uh, and the slides will be posted are different from the previous version of the webinar in that they include the 3.1 changes. So very briefly, uh, version 3.0 of eStewards was released to incorporate the ISO 14001 revisions. Um, ISO 14001 was revised and released in 2015 uh, and that triggered the revision to eStewards. So we have a, a whole entire separate webinar on ISO 14001 2015 that you're welcome to view uh, at your convenience to get some background information on why that standard was revised and what changed. Uh, we're not gonna spend a lot of time on that today. We have a lot to get through just with the eStewards changes. And as I said, those other webinars are already available to be reviewed at your convenience on PJR's website. So we're gonna skip some of this information about 14,001. And I'll leave it in the slides for you to reference if you download the slides after the presentation. Again, eStewards version 3.0 was revised to incorporate the changes to ISO 14,001 2015, including the adoption of a new structure. It also incorporated the sanctions interpretations published subsequent to version 2.0. I mentioned how that process has changed. And this is what the structure looks like now. You'll see that this looks familiar um, if you're familiar with ISO 9001 2015 or ISO 14001 2015, they'll all be following this Annex SL structure. As I said, we're going to skip the the a lot of this information about ISO 14001 2015, but at the base of those revisions is an emphasis on leadership, a focus on risk management, emphasis on objectives measurement and change, some changes to the communication and awareness requirements, and greater flexibility in how an organization meets the requirements and intent of the standard. In addition to that, version 3.0 of eStewards removes footnotes. Um, these will be replaced with a guidance document instead. Again, they change the process for how they will revise future documents or versions of the standard, how they'll release those changes. Top management responsibilities have been revised. There are changes to the compliance evaluation schedule requirements, import export requirements, tracking of nonconformances, material balance accounting requirements, 
internal auditor qualifications. And it reinstated some requirements that had been removed in ISO 14001-2015 as far as what documented procedures are required and the need to have preventive actions as well as corrective actions. There are also some key term changes in eStewards version 3.0, which again, I'll leave in the slides here for you to review on your own time in more detail. But I did want to emphasize um, that a broker is not eligible for eStewards certification. And this definition of an organization goes into a lot of detail as to who would be eligible for eStewards certification. There are some changes to the compliance obligations definition. Significant change is <laughs> significant. Um, any changes that could affect the organization's commitments um, need to be reported to the certification body, which would be your registrar, such as PJR, as well as the eStewards program administrator. And we'll talk a little bit more about that later. Downstream provider. The definition has changed in version 3.1. This was previously known as the downstream processor. Now includes final disposal facilities, but still excludes intermediaries. Final disposition, um, the the definition has been expanded, um, including ATEs, PCMs, or HEWs. And you can, again, review the standard for more detail on these terms. Um, but you'll note at the bottom, the underlined portion is that the final disposal includes hazardous processing residuals, ash, filter cake, slag, items like that, um, the definition was not specific to the final disposal of those items in the previous revision. Got some other significant terms here related to 14,001, life cycle, risk, performance. Some of these are new, some of these are revised, but again, you can review the changes to ISO 14001-2015 through the slides and previous webinars. Okay. So we're going to spend the majority of the time today going through uh, clause changes for e-stewards. So starting at the beginning, we're, we're not gonna go through every single clause. We're gonna focus on the changes uh, for version 3.0 and also version 3.1. And I'll try to distinguish between the two in case um, you're curious. So understanding the organization and its context, um, context requires the organization to determine external and internal issues that affect its ability to achieve the intended outcomes of the system. And that term is underlined. It's a term that can be found in the standard itself. And you'll definitely want to take a close look at what that means, because the emphasis for some of these changes is whether or not the organization is, is meeting the intended outcomes of the, the management system. And these can be positive and negative impacts. We also want to look at what interested parties mean and make sure that the organization has identified all of the relevant interested parties to be able to understand and monitor what their requirements may be. All of this needs to be taken into consideration when determining the scope of the management system. And again, eStewards adds the health, safety, data security, and social accountability aspects to the ISO 14001 environmental base requirements. 
The scope of the management system includes any ancillary sites that an organization may, may have and applies to all electronic equipment that comes under the e-steward organization's control. And control is not the same thing as ownership. So that's another important concept to keep in mind. They don't have to own the material for them to be in control of it and have it be relevant to the East Birds management system. This management system must be documented and there is some flexibility as to what that means. And it needs to include a precautionary approach. We talked about a life cycle approach earlier and the focus on risk management. So really trying to be more proactive here um, identifying risks before they manifest themselves into an incident, for example, um, proactively identifying the potential instead of reacting to an accident or an incident or a release. And in terms of e-stewards, the precautionary principle specifically means taking action to prevent exposure if the, the potential is there or there's suspicion of it being an issue or a risk, even if it hasn't been scientifically proven. And they use the example of the um, BFR exposure that is suspected when shredding plastics. Section five uh, is leadership. And we see, again, as I mentioned earlier, an emphasis on the accountability of leadership and communication, documentation and adequate resources for roles and responsibilities, and having methods to evaluate performance or effectiveness in these areas. And the EHSMS, which is the eStewards Management System, uh, team responsibilities are expanded to include hazard analysis, risk assessments, objectives, investigations, management of change, um, different things like that. Risk assessments are required initially every three years and upon any significant changes. So again, take a look at what that significant change definition is in the in standard to know when one may be occurring at your facility. And again, similar to the scope, this includes all ancillary sites and all operations under the e-steward organization's control. I mentioned earlier that eStewards version 3.0 reinstates some of the requirements for a documented procedure that might have been removed in ISO 14001, and the, e, the environmental and stewardship aspects clause is an example of that, as well as the requirement to have a documented compliance evaluation schedule. And it's really important for workers to have access to any compliance obligations or legal requirements that are applicable to their job, whether it's in the form of work instructions or training, they need to know what's applicable to them. And the format in which you do that is, is up to the organization. The Export, Transit, and Import Compliance Obligations Clause now applies to shipments of PCMs as well in that PCM shipments shall also be prohibited wherever any country prohibits the, tran the transboundary movements of HEWs or hazardous wastes. Halogenated material plastics may be an exception. And anyone who's certified to the e-steward standard is required to meet, um, meet the ban amendment requirements. So that's an important reminder. Objectives and targets are to be updated at least annually with a documented action plan or method of meeting the objective. The East Stewards organization needs to identify 
which countries they can import and export to and from, and what controls might be required to meet any compliance obligations. This particular section focuses on incoming material, such as the sales or procurement departments, making sure that this is planned effectively, whereas the following clause focuses on outgoing material, so focusing on the downstream management of those wastes. This is something that you can combine into one process or one plan. They don't have to be separate, um, but the clauses are, are separated in the standard. Clause 6.2.5 covers uh, a site closure plan, which, may, which must be maintained up to date, have a documented financial instrument, and a copy of this needs to be provided annually to the e-stewards program administrator. That's covered further down in the standard, but just a reminder that that's an annual requirement. And version 3.1 includes changes to this section in that all assets to be used as collateral to secure a financial instrument must also be part of that written plan and kept up to date. Six two six goes on to talk about the financial uh, instrument a bit more, or financial surety, in the case of closure or abandonment. Again, we're also looking at ancillary sites. Hazardous wastes cannot be used as collateral or asset value. And another version three point one revision is that all the assets that are used as collateral not only do they need to be documented and kept up to date in that plan they also need to be wholly owned by the organization so they have to be legally able to use those funds for this purpose by owning the material or the equipment in question and then they also have to legally designate the value of those assets for site closure so that even in the event of bankruptcy, those funds go uh, to those cleanup activities. There are some changes to the competency requirements in clause 7.2, including evaluating training effectiveness and what orientation or onboard training for employees must include or who they need to include, I should say. There's also an expansion of the awareness section as far as what workers need to be aware of when meeting the e-stewards requirements. <coughs> Excuse me. The communication section includes greater detail as to who, what, how, um, requirements. Uh, it, it's really requiring the organization to spell out or define how it will communicate to whom, um, what types of information will be communicated. And this is especially important for employees, obviously, but also contractors and visitors who might come on site and might need relevant information at that time. Documentation relevant to the e-stewards management system needs to be maintained, uh, needs to be controlled. And that includes making sure that the current version is made available, previous versions are not available, how long they will be retained. Documented information can control, can include uh, documents and records. Clause 8.1 switches gears to operational planning and control. This again requires a documented procedure, timely responses to any new or changing information. And 
the concept of life cycle review introduced by ISO 14001 or a life cycle approach expands uh, some of the considerations for um, potential impacts or uh, items for consideration. So for example, in East Stewards version 3.0, this expanded life cycle should include alternative uses of toxic materials. For 8.2, you need a documented emergency response plan, and the standard specifies some items to be included in that plan. The industrial hygiene clause requires controls for the prevention of migration of hazards. This is an important concept depending on the industry um, where the potential exposure through particulate matter or dust or airborne contaminants, uh, et cetera, may be transferred through break rooms, uh, uniforms, shoes, um, equipment that goes home with the employees, uh, anywhere where it may be tracked to places we don't want it to go, um, going home with the employee at the end of the, the shift or into the break room where they're gonna be eating and drinking and may maybe um, you know ingested concepts like that. And again, with a proactive approach, also looking for uh, timely responses to any changes to industrial hygiene concerns. Striving for continual improvement of air quality is an important change in the eStewards version 3.0. And changes some requirements in 8.3.4 related to noise ha hazards. For example, you need to retest the noise levels after implementation of any controls and implement additional controls if noise levels, levels are still above the exposure limit. In other words, if you do your hearing testing or your noise testing and it indicates action is needed, you need to retest after you take those actions to make sure that it has had the desired effect on the noise levels, otherwise additional action will be required. And if implementing those said controls will take more than three months, you'll need to do annual testing. So that's something to keep in mind. Asbestos containing equipment, is added to clause 8.4.1. Examples being knob and tube wire insulation or older heating equipment. That gets added to the list of materials that cannot be shredded without a closed system. Not much changed in 8.5.3 related to data sanitization, however, there is now a requirement for even mobile shredding and da data sanitization personnel um, with specified training. A version 3.1 change to clause 8.6 is that the organization shall retain responsibility for completion of the requirements in this clause and standard um, prior to electronic equipment going into reuse, regardless of whether or not the organization outsources any of those activities to an end refurbisher. So what that means, what that reminder is, kind of going back to the control definition that we talked about a little bit before, there, the organization is still responsible for the materials and the adherence to the requirements of the standard, whether they're doing the work themselves or whether they're outsourcing it to another entity. Eight point six point one specifies that all EEs, electronic equipment, not just HEEs and PCMs, must be tested for reuse. There is a table with exceptions, which I did not include in this presentation. You can refer to the standard for that. The requirement to take back exported HEEs has been removed, and version 3.1 includes some additional revisions 
um, some changes to the battery testing criteria um, and some additional information or requirements related to non-removable batteries. There are some additional requirements <clears throat> for alternative uses for HEEs and PCMs found in 8.7.2, but those include the need to conduct and document uh, the items listed here, a regulatory and literature review, life cycle review, downstream due diligence on the, uh, on the facility that would be doing the alternative uh, process, and its recycling chain. And also alternative uses and processes requires written approval from the East Stewards Administrator. It's an important to remember that an operating permit does not constitute evidence of a best practice. In other words, just because an organization has obtained a operating permit um, and is able to conduct their business or run their process does not mean that it will meet the criteria of the ICE, of the East Stewards standard. And that's where this part comes in. You need to submit evidence of having done this research and hopefully obtain written approval from the East Stewards administrator. Otherwise, you would not be able to um, follow that route. 8.8 .8 covers export and import controls, um, which has been organized a little bit differently in the version of the 3.0 standard. Um, so it breaks it up into category. And it also adds a section regarding exports for repair to end refurbishers. So that's something that would be new and worth checking out. It's important to remember that the HEW definition includes all hazardous waste identified by the laws within the countries involved in trade. So it's possible, depending on the countries in your recycling chain, um, that their definition may be different than, for example, ours in the United States. And that's an important distinction to be looking into and confirming to make sure that the transactions are legal. As a reminder, trade of HEWs and applicable PCMs is prohibited between party members and non-party members, regardless of whether there's consent from a competent authority. So similar to a concept we were discussing a few minutes ago about an operating permit, just because a competent authority may issue a letter of consent, if it goes against the requirements of the East Steward standard, such as between party and non-party members, it will not meet the requirements of the East Stewards standard. No significant changes related to trade um, prohibitions between developed and developing countries, that's still banned, um, and no consent from a competent authority or, or similar uh, organization would be acceptable if that trade is prohibited. So again, we're following the Basel Ban Amendment over the, um, the, con uh, the competent authority if they're issuing a letter of consent. We no longer require an import permit for plastics recycling, but you do need to have evidence that the country doesn't ban those imports. Version 3.0 allows the export and import of collet used to make new CRTs, so glass collet. So that's a change for version 3.0. And if new electron equipment is under warranty and fails, returns may be made without adhering to the requirements of 8.8, .8 and 2, provided that the trade is legal. We have some additional requirements related to exports for repair 
including data security, export, and downstream accountability. Whereas in the past, perhaps the verbiage or the intent was just for items destined for reuse. In version 3.1, we have a change that says that new parts or devices purchased for repair, replacement, or a money-back warranty are also exempt from Clause 8.9 if the prescribed criteria are met. So that's a change. Clause 8.9.3 has been restructured to go in a time sequence order and differentiates between e-stewards and non-e-stewards certified organizations. Just to make it a little bit easier to understand what you need to do as far as due diligence, depending on whether or not the facility has e-steward certification. We have to have authorized transporters. And there's an important note here that electronic equipment is not to be processed by any company in the recycling chain that has lost their e-steward certification unless or until it is reinstated. So this is different from a company that does not have e-stewards and has never had e-stewards. This is talking about an organization that was certified to the e-steward standard and had that certification suspended or revoked for some reason. Version 3.1 removed a allowance or a section in the standard that allowed untested or non-functioning electronic equipment to be sent for repair or refurbishment um, to a domestic uh, and refurbisher without initial on-site audits. So that is no longer allowable. Even in that situation, audits would be required. Clause 8.10 covers insurance and some specific qualification requirements have been identified in this section as to who is qualified to um, fill this role or make the, the decisions spelled out in this particular section of the standard. So this is similar to internal auditor qualifications as far as what criteria someone must meet to be able to uh, fulfill this part of the standard. A written procedure is required for monitoring and measurement. It needs to address accidental um, breakage of any ATEs, as this usually includes some cleanup work. A written procedure is required for evaluation of compliance. And we mentioned this earlier, you can find in the standard that there is a new compliance evaluation schedule requirement. 9.1.3 related to objectives really requires active monitoring. So again, this comes back to being proactive. It comes back to um, meeting the intended outcomes of the system and how important that is in relation to continual improvement. Section 9.1.4 uh, includes the addition of a logging requirement. This was identified in version 2.0, but it needs to include nonconformities, security breaches, non-conforming product that may be received. And this can be combined into one log. It can be separated into different forms or formats. Uh, that's really up to the organization. But again, from version two to three, there's some additional requirements to be logged. So take a look at that section. Facility inspections are to go beyond operational and housekeeping controls to ensure 
the procedures are implemented at all levels within the organization, and the risk assessment and industrial hygiene results must be submitted annually to a medical professional. Mass balance must be calculated at least every six months with a discrepancy of no more than 5%. The closure plan must be submitted to the eStewards program, ad program administrator for each processing facility. There are changes to the internal auditor qualification requirements for additional clarity at least. Internal audit is to yield identification of strengths and weaknesses, such as opportunities for improvement, and must be conducted on an annual basis covering the entire eStewards management system. And this should include an agenda for each audit and any records of auditor qualifications. Management review requires top management uh, participation, ensuring actions are taken and resource allocation is appropriate in order to submit support continual improvement. The section also restores the requirement to have preventive actions. And additional inputs and outputs must include industrial hygiene monitoring, internal audit results, facility inspections, and conformity to the policy or policies. I mentioned earlier that in general, this standard is more proactive. We're required to have a written nonconformity, preventive, and corrective action procedure. And as mentioned earlier, preventive actions uh, are reintroduced. This is a term that was removed in ISO 14001 2015, but version 3.0 has reinstated that requirement. Appendix A doesn't have any significant changes, although some content was moved into the standard itself. Appendix B contains some important information even for organizations such as the fact that home-based operations are not eligible for certification. Corporate certification uh, subject now extends to entities owned by spouses. So if you have multiple organizations there's a requirement within these stewards that um, all of the, the organizations or the facilities within a country be certified within a certain period of time. And that used to be based on ownership, and it still is, but now it includes ownership um, in the spouse's name. And part of how this is determined or verified is by submitting an ownership chart to the certification body, such as PJR so that we can understand the relationship between the different entities. An annual license agreement is required. Version 3.1 has added some requirements related to suspension of certification. Specifically, the eStewards Program Administrator will suspend the license ag licensing agreement for an organization if the certification body, such as PJR, has suspended their certificate. On the other hand, if the eStewards program administrator issues a critical nonconformity against an organization, the certification body, such as PJR, is required to withhold, withdraw, or suspend, as applicable, the eStewards certification. So the point of this is that they really go hand in hand, and if you lose one, you'll lose the other until it's resolved. Here, significant changes comes up again. And so you need to understand that definition and what constitutes a significant change. And you also need to have a process in place to ensure 
that the appropriate parties are notified in a in a timely manner. And this is really uh, a significant change um, within five business days. So you need to know what a significant change is and how or who will be responsible for um, reporting that to the relevant parties. This is not new, but just as a reminder, a documented procedure is required for unannounced performance verification inspections, should e-stewards decide to do that. Appendix C talks about how subsequent changes to the standard will be published through a revised copy, such as version 3.1, which is available now, instead of through the sanctioned interpretations, as was previously the case. And actually, Appendix D contains the changes between version 3 and version 3.1 by citing the clauses that are affected by uh, those changes. So if you just want a high-level overview of um, where to look for changes, in addition to this webinar, you can look at Appendix D. Okay, so that's the bulk of our presentation. So I'm just gonna really quickly go through the certification process for anyone who may not be familiar with it, and then we'll get to any questions that we may have. So to initially become certified to eStewards, the first step would be to establish the documentation to meet the eStewards requirements, for which you'll need to get a copy of the eStewards standard. You'll need to train affected personnel and employees on the EHSMS or eStewards management system requirements. You'll need to implement those requirements, including conducting internal audit, uh, compliance evaluation, and a management review. You'll also need to con contract with a certification body, such as PJR, and you will complete stage one and stage two audits, one of each, before a certificate can be issued. So that's if you're pursuing eStewards certification or any other type of certification for the first time, that is what the process looks like. And any nonconformities resulting from the stage two will need to be addressed and closed before that certificate will be issued as well. Going back to what the stage one and stage two audits constitute, um, stage one is an on-site document review of your EHSMS and the it really evaluates your readiness to move on to stage two. The stage two audit, um, which would be scheduled subsequent to the stage one audit, is an on-site audit of your entire management system. Not just your documentation, but the actual implementation of the requirements and whether or not you're meeting the requirements of the standard. Any nonconformities will need to be resolved prior to, to certification issuance, as I mentioned. And after you have that certificate, you are placed on either annual or semi-annual audits, depending on your contract. And those surveillance audits, at least annually or at least once per calendar year, are partial system audits where we don't have to cover all of the processes. We can conduct a sampling and cover the balance or cover all of them at the recertification audit, which is the third year of the cycle and is very similar to a stage two audit in that we cover all of the processes and that the audit results in a certificate after any nonconformities have been resolved uh, because the certificates are good for three years. Okay, so I will take a peek at whether or not we have any questions, but in the meantime, I'm just going to put this slide up here with our contact information in case you have any questions or want to learn more about uh, anything that we talked about today. Um, the EHS Program Manager, her name is Nancy Bednars, and her email is here, or you can reach her by calling the main PJR number. Similarly, my email address is here, and I can also be reached through the main PJR number. 
And if you're a new client looking for a quote, feel free to call our sales department. And I have their contact information up here as well. Okay, now it does look like we have some questions, so let's see. The financial um, surety instrument is to be provided to e-stewards. Is this during the audit or does it have to go directly to e-stewards similar to the annual sub report submitted online? This would not be during your audit. This would be uh, your responsibility as an organization to submit that information to the e-stewards program administrator. And there is more information about that on, uh, in the standard itself in those relevant uh, clauses. So I would take a look at that. I believe there's an email address or a process for submitting that spelled out somewhere, um, but it would not be during your audit that you would be submitting that to eStewards. Certainly your auditor will be looking for evidence that you provided it to eStewards, as well as auditing those documents and that information as part of the audit process, but um, you'll want to send those directly to eStewards. The next question is, does eStewards publish a list of companies that have had their eSteward certification revoked? Um, that's a good question. I am not sure if they do or not. Um, hmm. I would have to do some research into that. I'm not sure. Um, yeah, I'm not sure. We'd have to we'd have to look around their website or um, contact the eStewards program administrator for some guidance on that. It's a good question. Okay, do we have any other questions today? I'll hang out here for one more second in case anyone's typing anything. But otherwise, thank you so much for joining us today. The slides will be posted at PGR's website and a recording of today's webinar will be made available as well. Thank you for joining us and good luck with your eStewards trans transition.